The seat is taken, huh? <laughs> As Pro or an iPad? It's an iPad Pro or an iPad? Okay, folks, time to get started. We're in session 21 which means the end of the session will be 75% of the way done with this class, which is my indirect way of nagging you saying, if you've not started on your you know, project, get started, because there are a few of you who've never sent me a DCF. I have no idea whether you even picked a company and I've given up trying. So if you do finish a DCF by the next, I mean, I know the window is long been closed, but I keep opening it a little bit and letting the few DCFs in. So if you really want feedback, I'll still give you the feedback. Okay. So today we're going to almost complete the pricing set. Last session, if you remember, and I, I'll be quite honest, that's the session I dread the most in this class is the last session because you know it's multiple after multiple algebra after algebra, and after a while you get you know I don't know what that equation does. But what was the why were we doing that other than to torture you? Why did I go through multiple my multiple uh, Isha? You want, and why do we know, need to know what's driving a multiple? Because those are the questions you're going to ask me, right? So think of it as if somebody's trying to sell me shares on a price to book ratio, what are the three, four questions? That's the end game. So we're going to come back and talk about reviewing that. But I want to start today with something that each of you potentially could face at the end of this project. So you value the company, you come up with a DCF value. As I said, about 70, I don't know whether I mentioned, about 70% of you in your DCFs that you turned in found your company to be overvalued. About 30% found it to be undervalued, somewhere in that statistic. So you got a valuation of your company. So let's say you value a company, come up with a value of $10 per share. The stock is trading at 15. If I stop right there, this is a slam dunk, right? Because what do you have to do? Decide whether to buy or sell the stock. And based on that valuation, what are you, are you going to buy or sell? Stocks at 15, you valued it at 10. Come on, you got a 50-50 shot. You say, I'm not buying, I'm selling, it's overvalued. But then you do the pricing, which is the next and second phase, and much shorter phase, and you price your company. It's a software company against other software companies. And you come up with a pricing. That's the right word, but you call it evaluation. Let's call it, say, $20. You're faced with a quandary, right? Is the stock un overvalued, which is what your DCF tells you it is? Is it underpriced or valued? It's what's um, what the multiple. Or could I take the 10 and the 20 and add them up and divide by two? This is so convenient because then you get 15 and it's right. Don't even go there. Okay. 
So when you valued and priced your company, for God's sakes, please don't average the two and say, no, I'm uncertain about both numbers. I'll take the middle. That's like saying I'll be a Muslim the first half of the day and a Christian the second half. You're going to be, you're going to have a tough time splitting the difference and trying to reconcile irreconcilable differences somewhere along the way. Philosophically, these are very different ways of thinking about value. You can't take the middle ground and say, hey, that's the best place to be. Can I make the argument that this stock is both undervalued and overvalued at the same time? Sounds odd, right? Now do you see why I kept asking you to use the word priced when you did pricing? Because it's undervalued, it's in this case underpriced and overvalued. Both statements are true. Today I'm going to give you a couple of examples with companies I valued already in this class that I'll price again and come up with a very different conclusion and say, I'm okay with these. They're not contradictory because I'm asking two different questions. So that's the first part. Let's take, um, price, stay with pricing. When I talked about pricing, I said pricing is based on who you compare your company to. It's based on the comparables. Today, we're going to talk about expanding the comparables. Look at the entire market. Can you price the stock against the market? I don't see why not. Look at what every other stock is priced at. Let's say you do that for this company, the same software company, and you come up with a pricing of $10 again based on pricing it against the market. So now you have $10 from your intrinsic value, $20 from pricing against the sector, and $10 pricing against the entire market. You know, how can you get two different pricings? Depending on who you compare it to. You know what it's telling you though, right? The fact is if you get a $10 pricing against the market, and a $20 pricing against the software sector, that tells you about how the market's pricing software companies. Because if it pushes up the pricing of every software company, when you price a company against other software companies, you're going to feed it in. We were just talking about chat GPT and AI companies. Right now, the pricing is all high. If you price any AI company now, you're going to get a high price. Why? Because everybody else is paying high prices. You price it against the market, might not be as attractive. So we'll deal with those as we go through. And I can see it's going to be my allergy day already. So forgive me for wiping my nose. Or blow, blowing your nose is pretty disgusting into a mic. So I'll try not to blow my nose. So let's go back to the notes. I think we were on page 55. So don't, don't let this page intimidate you. So remember the last class I did P ratios, peg ratios, price to book ratios, EV to EBITDA, EV to sales, right? With each one I did the algebra. Think of this as kind of a cheat sheet of every conceivable multiple. So you've got at the top equity multiples where I start with the dividend discount model, tell you the drivers of the equity multiples. Enterprise value multiples, I start with an enterprise value model, work up. So it's basically a cheat sheet of everything we did in the last class. The drivers of each multiple. Today, we're going to put the grunt part and we're going to apply because once you've done the define, describe, analyze, you're in a position to apply. So let's say you decide to start your pricing this weekend. You have an open weekend. I'm not prejudging it, but let's say you have time and say, I'm going to do my price. What's the first step? You've got to find comparable companies, right? And for the last 75 years in Wall Street, when you say comparable companies, what are you trained to do? You have a software company. You go looking for other software companies. You have a steel company, you look for other steel companies. Deep, why, why do we do that? What is it that we do when we, what are we implicitly assuming about software or steel companies? When we do so? One is we're assuming they're correctly priced, which is always the case, but we're also assuming that they all look roughly the same in terms of growth and cash flows and risk. We're cheating, right? Because we don't know how to control risk or software companies. Is that true? 40 years ago, it was probably true. Sectors were homogeneous. Today, you take the software set. Who's that? Who's the biggest player? You got Microsoft, you got Adobe, and then you got all these tiny software companies. They're all part of the sector, very different companies. So let me suggest a revolutionary idea, which is rather than compare Microsoft to other software companies, should I be comparing it to other companies that look just like it in terms of cash flows, growth, and risk? Companies that dominate their sectors of high margins, big revenues. I would argue that that's closer to a comparable from an intrinsic value standpoint than staying with the sector. 
So today we're going to talk about tricks you can use to change your definition of comparable so you bring in companies more like yours. But no matter how careful you are about defining comparable, one of the things you're going to face once you've got that list of 15, 20, 25, or 30 companies is there will be differences between your company and those companies. Differences on growth, differences on cash flow, differences on risk. You have to control for those differences. Right now, you know how equity research analysts control for those differences? They tell stories. Like what? My stock has a PE of 18. The average for the sector is 15. But that's okay because my company has higher growth. That's incomplete to me. And here's why. You've explained the direction. It's like many of you told me stories about increasing margins. But many of you didn't complete your story. So you told me your company went, had a margin of minus 5%. It will improve margin. You told a really good story of why the margin will improve. But they did a target margin of 20%. And you know, part of the story wasn't told. Why 20%? I could see why you moved from negative to positive, but why to 20%? So when you think about pricing, you've got to do the same thing. Not only do you tell me how, as a variable change, it's a multiple change, but by how much. So let's start with the basic choice. So this weekend, you say, okay, I'm going to do pricing. You have to find comparable companies, right? How many of you, and I want an honest answer, have access capital IQ? It doesn't work for you. Okay, so you need to talk to IT about this. It should be working. That, is that true for everybody that stopped working for everybody or just for Isha? Maybe they don't have, they don't like her and they've cut her out of the IT system. So you, you're having, is it from, from just home or is it from here? On campus won't work. Then I think, I don't know, this, this is an IT problem. I've completely given up on that. So I will email IT and say, that seems to be a problem. I may, can I mention a few names and they'll contact you and maybe wipe you out or whatever they do at IT to remove the centers. But it, but if you have capital IQ, the night, this is the part of the project where it's going to be most necessary. Why? Because if you go to capital IQ, there's a little box that says screening. You click on the screening, it'll be, an, you could say, it'll give you a whole list of criteria. What do you want to screen? It's like, I want to screen based on geography. I want to look at only US companies. You go and click US companies. It'll come back with 19,000 US companies. Now, obviously, you don't want 19,000 companies in your sample. They say, I want software companies in the US. You click software companies. It'll come back with 1,300 software companies. And then you say, you know what? My software company is a large software company with a market cap greater than 100 billion. I want a market cap greater than 100 billion. That is, it'll come up with a list of 30 software companies, market cap greater than that. You have the tools to basically create a customized sample. Now, your first instinct is you want to find companies just like yours, right? Same size, same business. The more criteria you add, the fewer companies are going to come through. Let's just play math. This morning, somebody's valuing Home Depot or pricing Home Depot, and they got a jump in the project, and they said they went into building retail. So in retail, they picked the building retail, which makes sense. And then they picked, because Home Depot is a big company, market cap greater than 200 billion. And they got a sample size of one. You know what the sample size of one was, it? They got Home Depot. This doesn't help. You can't compare Home Depot to Home Depot. So here's a choice you're going to have to face. Do you want to define your criteria to find, to find companies just like yours and end up with a small sample? Or are you willing to accept more differences and end up with a much bigger sample? Which do you think is better? Small sample of like companies or a bigger sample of Companies that might be different. Trade off, right? It depends on what it, it really depends on what you plan to do with that sample. Because here are your choices. You can eyeball the data and start to say this company looks good, this company looks bad. If that's what you plan to do, you want to keep the sample small. You know, for much of the last century, if you're an auto analyst in the US, you know how big a sample size is? Three. GM, Ford, and Chrysler. That's all you had. You had history. And all our analysts, you know, they immerse themselves in the three companies and they develop rules of thumb. You know, GM trades at a PE ratio 25% higher than Ford, and then they will make investing judgments or pricing judgments. Three companies. So if you're going to just do this eyeballing, I want to understand each data, keep your sample small, otherwise you're going to go crazy. 
The second thing you could do is you can make a, make a slightly larger sample. And then if there's a difference, talk about differences in growth, then maybe learn a little bit by looking across eight or nine companies. The third choice is you take whatever variable that you're worried about and bring it into your multiple. What are you talking about? Remember the peg ratio? I talked about the history of peg ratios. You can almost see that poor analysts in the 1970s working for Peter Lynch and has been asked to find growth companies sitting there in front of a list of companies with PE ratios and growth rates and recognizing very quickly that if you pick companies just based on low PE ratios, none of the growth companies were coming in. So do you blame them for uncocking a peg ratio because it allowed them to bring growth into the equation? But the consequence, of course, was you created a horrendous multiple in terms of being able to explain it. And there's a fourth choice. Open up your statistics book. We already did last session, right? When you talk about PE ratios across countries, Statistics, as I mentioned in the last class, was designed to do exactly this. Control for difference across countries. So you ready? I'm going to play the role of a really bad equity research analyst. I'm going to get fired five times in the next 15 minutes. I'm going to fire myself. I'm going to give out bad advice. Your job is to ask me the right questions. So with each one, I'm going to put up a recommendation. And then we'll let, 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 let you ask me questions because you know the questions you need to ask. So I'm the beverage analyst. This is my set, long time ago. They're beverage companies and I'm a very naive analyst. So I put out a buy recommendation on three companies. Andre's wine, have you heard of them? They produce champagne that's so cheap that watching a commercial for their champagne, I think gives you a headache. And it comes around Christmas every year. Now, really cheap champagne, dollar for a whole bottle. It's like Trader Joe's one dollar wine. But I think that's drinkable. This is not really cheap champagne. Second is Todd Hunter. And the third is Hanson. Todd Hunter, I have no idea what they even do. I think some kind of whiskey that only a few people drink or something like that. And Hanson Natural, of course. You've seen the Hanson Natural soaps. Why did I pick these three? I told you I was a very naive analyst. What, is the, what, what, what made these three, three stand out to me? Low PE ratios. So ask me the question. I've given away the information actually in the next few columns. With Andre Wine and Todd Hunter, why is my PE ratio so low? It's horrendous growth. In fact, if I hadn't given the growth rate, it'd have been mystified. So I gave you so what about Hansen Natural? It looks like a good deal, right? Growth is high, PE is low. What's a what's a what's mismatch? It's a third column I've given you, right? They have the highest risk. I miss, I mean, it, and that's what I mean about sloppy pricing is often you see analysts, the data will be staring them in the face and they're still looking at PE ratio and say, hey, how come you're not looking at growth and risk? I'm not saying that, you no, know, Hansen could not be cheap, but I'm saying you need to control for difference in growth and risk. And by not controlling for them, I'm essentially waving my hands and I don't even see how you can make a pricing judgment if you cannot quantify how much growth matters and how much risk matters. So I get fired as a beverage analyst. So I land on my feet. I'm the telecom ADR analyst. Let me give you a history of the telecom business. Until the 1980s, the only telecom company in the world that was traded was AT&T. Only the US had a traded telecom company. The rest of the world, telecom companies were government owned. The 1980s and 90s, many of these telecom companies were privatized. In other words, they went to public companies. And many of those companies decided to list in the US and have ADRs. ADRs are basically those companies trade in the US. The nice thing about ADRs is your earnings have to be restated using GAAP, which is a big deal in that time because you had different accounting standards. So there are my, there's my sector and there's the PE ratio for each of these companies. I'm still naive. That firing didn't cure the ninth day, so I pick my cheaper stocks. I ask you to buy Indosat and Telebras. Telebras, of course, then was the Brazilian telecom company, it's since been broken up into seven telecom companies. And Indosat was the Indonesian telecom company. And this was in the immediate aftermath of a crisis in Indonesia in 1996 that caused the entire country's economy to melt down. So they look cheap, right? But I've given you one clue to what? 
you look at the growth rate, they have among the lowest growth rates in the set. So that's one thing that's the better. You know what the other is? These are all telecom ADRs, but there's a mix of telecom ADRs. Indosat and Telebras are emerging markets, but you also have the Danish telecom company, the Deutsche telecom company, the, you have some developed market telecom companies. And this was in an age when emerging markets were really much riskier than developed markets. So if you're asking just qualitative questions, one thing you worry about is the low growth. And the other thing you worry about is the fact that some of these companies are emerging market companies and some are developed markets. At some point, you stop the hand waving and say, I've got to do something a little more specific. So here's what I did. I ran a regression. Again, a regression is just a tool. I have a dependent variable, which is PE ratios of these companies. I'm trying to explain them why differences in growth and whether they're emerging market or developed market companies. You know what a dummy variable is? A dummy variable is a variable that takes on a value of either zero or one. So I went through my database and if it's an emerging market telecom company, I put a, a one and a developed market company, I put a zero. I ran the regression against the growth rate and the emerging market dummy variable. So let's see what this regression tells me. Let's take the constant, 13.12. What does that tell me? It tells me how the entire sector is being priced. The sector is being priced higher. Right now, if I did this for AI, I'd start with a large intercept because everybody's priced high. So it kind of brings that adjustment in. What is this 121.22 coefficient on growth tell me? Every 1% increase in growth in this sector increases my PE by 1.21. So if your growth rate is 10% higher than mine, that's a telecom company, your PE ratio should be roughly 12.1 higher than mine if I trust the market. But how would I read this minus 13.85 coefficient in the emerging market? Down. What does that tell me? Go ahead. Actually, worse than that, we have two companies, two telecom companies. So let's be very clear. This is just telecom specific. It's about the sector. They have the same growth rates, late 90s, but one is an emerging market telecom company. The other is a developed market telecom company. The emerging market telecom company's PE is 13.85, not 0 0.1385, 13.85 lower. So the first company is a PE of 25. The second company is going to have a PE of 11.15. What? Markets attack in emerging markets. If this were an intrinsic valuation, how do we bring in emerging markets? We do a country risk premium, we push up the discount rate. Think of this as the pricing analog. This is what the market is discounting emerging market companies for. It is your emerging market discount. Now, why did I do all of this? Because I thought Telebras was cheap, right? At 8.9 times earnings. Well, let's go back and plug the numbers for Telebras into the regression. 7.5% growth rate, emerging market company. I get a predicted PE of 8.35. It was trading at 8.9 times earnings. At 8.9 times earnings, Telebras is actually slightly overpriced, not underpriced, after I adjust for its low growth and its emerging market status. Same thing with Indosat. It looked cheap, but if you bring in, it's very low growth. In the fact, an emerging market company it becomes overpriced. What I've essentially done is taken the hand waving and said, you know what? Let's use statistics to quantify the effect, bring it in, and actually look at the price and see if, in fact, it's too high or too low, given the growth and given the risk. Yes, sir. It could be, this is all at telecom ADR. So I didn't do a subset of them, but if I picked out, I think you've raised an interesting question. Can I take a sample of 19 and make it look better by taking three companies out? You're going to be tempted. You're going to, because why is your R squared low there? That's an outlier, right? You say, oh, if I take that outlier, my R squared jumps. Don't go there. Because you take the first outlier out, guess what you find? A second outlier, then third outlier, and a fourth outlier. Before you're done, you've taken all the things that are explaining differences across companies and ended up with seven companies that look alike. So I know, and, but that often happens, right? So you don't know what the gaming has been on data before somebody sells you something. But it is susceptible. It's, 
I won't call it susceptible. It's if you have bias, you're going to find a way to bring that bias in by changing your sample or changing your multiples or taking out a variable that pushes in the wrong direction. Oh, that's a different question because I've looked at growth and risk because they're all telecom companies, right? The big differences for risk are going to be which country you're in, right? The growth I brought in. So the question is, there's a missing variable here. Why don't you put in a return in equity or something? My sample size kind of works against me because I only like 18 companies. I can't keep throwing variables in. I'll give you a general rule. The number of independent variables you can have in your regression is going to be a function of how many companies you have in your sample. If you have four companies, don't even run a regression. You know, don't show me, show me regression coefficient. It's pointless. You need at least 10, maybe you can get away, maybe nine, nine, 10. If you do regression with nine or 10 companies, you can run, you can have one independent variable. If you have 20 companies, you can have two. For every 10 companies in your samples, you get a little more leeway to add variables. Okay? So keep that in mind as you start building these regressions. One final point, I used this zero one. You know why I did it? Because A, I was lazy. And B, this was in the late 90s, where I did not have continuous measures of country risk. You know, today, what I could use instead of that zero one, because go ahead. I could use Lambda, but, is it, but remember, when you're in doing pricing, you're, you don't want to do any work, so you want something that somebody gives you. I could use a default spread, but even that's too much work for me. I'm too lazy to go look up default spreads. I could use a rating, you know, but it's, a, it's an alphabet and stuff to put an alphabet into it. Remember those PRS, those risk scores we talked about, you know, where you can look at? You, you can get that for 160 countries. It's a number, you put it in, and it'll give you a continuous measure of country risk. So today we actually can do things we could not have done across companies in the late 90s to bring in countries. I don't, but I find this dummy variable concept useful whenever you have something that uh, some of the companies say, let's say half your companies regulate, other half are unregulated. It's a way of capturing what is the effect of regulation on my PE ratios. You're in a red state versus a blue state. What is the effect of PE ratios of, depending on which state you operate your business in? It's a good way to kind of separate those effects. On pricing. So Telebras actually, once you plug in the numbers, turns out to be overvalued. And it's one reason why you want to bring in those other factors. So I get fired as a telecom. It's not because I ran the regression, but because I refused to run the regression. I land on my feet. I'm now the European bank analyst. These are my companies in my sample. Most of them I can't even pronounce, and I'm not even going to try. But I got the price to book ratios. You know why people like to use price to book ratios for banks? What is it about banks that makes their book values more meaningful? Anybody want to try? Yes, so okay. One is that mark to market, right? It's one segment where you're supposed to mark to market. So book value is supposed to be reflected what you have. And second is it actually affects your regulatory capital ratios. You can't play games with book value and get away with it. The price to book is often a widely used model. So I went with the status quo. I'm going to use price to book. And when you use price to book, and this is the advantage of applying after you've done the analysis, what's a companion variable? What's a variable that drives price to book? Return on equity. So I put up the return equity because I, when you did the algebra, you remember that popped out as the first variable. So I got the return equity. And then I threw in a proxy for risk. I threw in the standard deviation in stock prices, but in hindsight, I wish I'd used a risk measure more specific to bank. Remember, you've left the intrinsic value arena. There is no should be, could be. So you can't talk about betas are the only way of thinking. This is all done. So if I were thinking about a risk measure specific to banks that I could use, what would you look at? What makes some bank? Let's say you're running this regression today, price to book of US banks versus return in equity of US banks. What's the thing that worries you? What brought SVB down? What, what did they do? From what? 
It, it was actually from treasury bonds, from doing what they thought was the same thing. They bought T-bonds and they bought them, they bought 10-year bonds. So if I were able to get, and I think I can get from S&P cap, like I can eke out the data, what percentage of a bank's assets are in long-term bonds? I could throw that in as a risk measure, right? Because that's what is worrying investors now. My point is when you think about risk in a sector, be creative. Think about what in this sector people worry about. You want to bring in a proxy. So here I'm going to stay with the standard deviation. And my initial try, I'm going to eyeball. This is a very dangerous practice because my eyes start to glaze over after a while. But what am I looking for in a cheap bank here? I want a low price to book. By now, you know the, you know the drill. I want a high return equity, low return equity. High return equity, and I want low risk. So what I did was I computed a median for the sector. How does that median help you? When you go look for a price to book, I want a company with a price to book less than the median a return equity higher than the median and a standard deviation lower or higher than the median? Lower than the median. The closest I could get actually was, I think the, I thought I, BNP Paribas, I got two out of the three. I got low, there wasn't a single stock that met all three. Am I surprised? Not really. There's no, unless it's an obvious misprice. And if I'm looking for an overvalued stock, I'm looking for stocks that have price to book ratios higher than the median, returns in equity lower than the median, and standard deviation high. Try that out. It's a good starting point for pricing is get the companies in your sector, compute the medians, and look for companies that fall below or above, and look for, hey, is it something obvious to misprice? The eyeballing, though, the nothing here looked obviously underpriced or obviously overpriced in all three dimensions. So again, I went back to my statistics rule book. I said, look, rather than play eyeballing data, I'm going to run a regression of what price to book ratios of banks against return and equity and the standard deviation. And today, if I were running this for banks, the percentage of their assets in long-term bonds. Good news, the coefficients are all in the right direction. The reason I keep emphasizing this in a little while, I'm going to show you a regression, at least one regression where the sign doesn't fit what you expected it to be. It's my negative or positive instead of negative or negative instead of positive. We'll talk about why that happens here. Higher return equity companies, higher price to book ratios, and riskier companies of lower price to book ratios. The R squared, 79%. Small sample, I'm not going to get overjoyed, but it's still a pretty decent R squared for the sample that we have. And if you take every bank in here, I can make sense. Every 1% increase in my return equity increases my price to book ratio by 0 0.0363. Every 1% increase in the risk reduces my price to book. I've quantified the effects. I get predicted price to book ratios for all of my companies. So if we take by a Rishi or whatever, <laughs> German banks have names I can't even pronounce. The actual price to book ratio is 0 0.80. The predicted price to book ratio is 0 0.89. It's slightly overvalued. But what does that R squared of 79% do? I mean, where does it play out? If I had an R squared of 100%, my predictions would be perfect, right? With an R squared of 79%, that predicted price to book is going to have a range. 0.86 to 0.92. If the R squared were 20%, the range is going to get bigger. So that what I'm trying to say is, if you get an R squared of 20%, don't give up. It doesn't mean you cannot use the regression. It just means you get a bigger range. The bigger range means you will not be able to reject the hypothesis the stock is correctly priced. The one thing though that you should do when you run a regression, you see those, those numbers in brackets, those are my T-statistics, just make sure you don't have any noise in your regression by leaving a variable with a t-statistic of 0.3 or 0.5 in there because you're ruining your prediction with something that shouldn't even be in there. So any questions on the banking exam? So I get five as a European bank. So I thought I did a good job, but I guess I screwed up. And I now have become just a generalist. They give me the 100 largest market cap stock. In the, in the, they've given up on my capacity to look at sectors. You don't know enough about this. Tell us the cheapest, un, cheapest stocks, 100 largest market cap stocks. Now, this is actually a challenge, right? 100 mar largest market cap stocks in the, in, the, in the US 
have banks, they have technology companies, they have manufacturing companies, they have retail companies, all in that list. So I wanted to pick a multiple which I could use across the companies. When you have financial service companies in the mix, you cannot go with any enterprise value model. So already you're constrained because coming up with debt and cash for a bank is impossible. So I stayed with an equity model. I decided to stay with price to book. Companion variable return equity. Remember scatter plots from statistics? I did a scatter plot. How many, how many dots should there be on this scatter plot? So I would like at least one of you to actually count the dots for me sometime today and make sure there are 100. I'm not sure. Now, I think there should be 100. What's this line that through this? What is it? The best fit line. So how do you get the best fit line? I'd love to tell you. I've got a ruler and I tried different things. Luckily for me, the packet, any statistics packet, when you ask for a scatter plot, even Excel, ask you, do you want me to fit a bet? Just say yes. Even if you have no idea what it's going to fit, it's a regression line. It's fit through price. Here, what are those two outside lines? The confidence intervals, right? If the R squared were 100, the, there'd be only one line. As So this is a good way to visualize what a low R squared is doing, is the lower the R squared, the bigger the band is going to be. Notice that most of the 100 companies fall between the two lines. What does that tell me? Statistically, I cannot reject the hypothesis that those stocks are correctly priced. There are three stocks that fall above the line. Are those my most overpriced stocks or most underpriced stocks? What do you think? Most overpriced stocks. I'm going to read the names of the three and you tell me whether they share anything in common because it might give me a clue as to what I'm missing in the scatter plot. The three most overpriced stocks are Google, Infosys, and Gilead, Young Pharmaceutical Company. So whenever you see three companies and you see a common character, the reason you look is maybe there's a missing variable. That's why they look cheap. What do they share in common? They're high growth companies, right? Remember price to book is driven by return equity, but it's also driven by growth and risk. And by not controlling for growth, companies with high growth may look overpriced to me, but it's because I haven't factored in the growth. What about the three companies below the line? And I'll, uh, and I'll expand what they are. Conoco Phillips, Exxon Mobil, and Nokia. Nokia, let's throw Nokia out. No, Nokia, but to, you know, by this point in time, 2010, I had no idea what kind of company it was. The smartphone business was dead. I don't know what business they were in. Conoco Phillips and Exxon Mobil, two big oil companies. Red flags should go off already. You know why they looked underpriced? Because for oil companies, I'm using return equity, I'm using last year's net income. And 2010 happened to be over net income had bounced back, their return on equity had gone up, but markets were not being stupid and pricing them based on that net income. I'm trying to basically I've explained away the, you're saying, why did you even waste your time with the scatter plot? I'm going to explain away the mispricing. The 100 largest market cap stocks in the country. You're not going to find some massively mispriced stock in there that heavily followed, heavily invested in. But if I did this with 100 small cap stocks or 100 stocks in a market like Peru, where there might not be a lot of investors following a lot, who knows, you might find a, a significant mispricing. But that was my first step here, I ran the route. But if you are worried about the fact that growth is missing and you say, can I bring it in? I can, but you're not going to like the picture. It's called the three-dimensional scatter plot, and they make me dizzy whenever I look at it. You got price to book, return equity, and growth. It's like a think of it like a cardboard box, right? I want you to tell me where in this box your cheapest stocks can be found. I'll help you. You want low price to book or high price to book? Low price to book. You want high growth or low growth? High growth. And you want low return equity or high return equity? So you want low price to book, high return equity, and high growth. So this is where you're looking. I have some bad news. There's nothing there. The closest I get is actually time one. Remember, the closer you get, the more 
So in a sense, when you run three-dimensional graphs, the first step is for yourself noticing where the chief stock should be and then looking to see what's closest. That's your cheapest stock. So if you're one of the visual people, everything has to be in charts. You can try scatter plots. I, at some point in time, I just, I just give up on this. I, I have no idea how the time one is the closest. This is the, so I'll give you a, a much more, I think, pragmatic way of doing this. What's the most you can fit into the, uh, the scatter plot? I think three dimensions are about all you can fit in. I've never seen a four dimensional graph. Actually, I have. In fact, the way they did was they drew a dozen three dimensional graphs with different. So it actually is like this this, this 12 different three dimensional graphs. They're very pretty, but I have no idea how to use them, actually. But if I could do three-dimensional graphs, I could bring risk in too, right? I want low risk. So in a sense, you could pick your three variables and do it. But if you want to go beyond three variables, you're kind of stuck, right? If you do graph. Here's what I did instead. I decided to run a regression. I think you're one trick pony. You keep running regressions. I go there because at the end of the process, what else am I going to do? I had price to book ratios by dependent variable, beta growth and return equity. I'm going to read out the coefficients. The first thing I want you to check is are the signs going in the right direction? Higher beta stocks have lower price to book ratios. Make sense? That makes sense. Higher growth stocks have higher price to book ratios. And higher return equity stocks have so keep side relief. These are signs are right. Next stop, check to see whether the variables statistically explain much. Go to the T-statistic, and basically, as you look across the T-statistic, return equity, dominant variable, second best growth. And then when you look at the coefficient for beta, notice that it's 0.26. I left beta in here because I wanted to bring home this point. If I would actually rerun this regression. I would take beta out of the regression because it's adding noise. Will it affect the R squared? Very, very much because the T statistic and the R squared are connected at the hip. You take out a low T statistic variable, you'll get a much more usable and much better regression by taking those coefficients. Um, part of you would say, but it should matter. What should matter doesn't really matter. When you're doing pricing, it's not what you should you would think should belong there. It's based on what the market's actually pricing. And if I use this regression, I can get a predicted price to book ratio of every single company. I usually update these uh, these 100 largest market cap regressions every year. This year, I'll be too lazy to do it. I should do it someday soon. But this was my 2022 update. Notice something about the range in this. It looks like a huge range, right? Almost nothing falls outside the range. And why is the range so much bigger in 2022 than in 2010? The R squared is so for whatever reason in 2022 that the it's not something that's happened over time. It goes up and down by from me. So that's what I meant about low R squares and higher R squares, rather than thinking about them as good or bad things. The way they show up as as much wider range, low R squares, makes it more difficult to find something that's underpriced or overpriced enough. To fall outside the range. So I get fired as the market, 100 largest market cap company. So I thought I did a good job, but I guess they didn't like it. And they put me, so now they're moving me to more and more boring sectors. This is their vision of punishment. So they moved me to becoming analyst for the trucking sector. I can't get any worse than this. So I look at the sector, and now they asked me to use EV to EBITDA because that's what we use. And I come back with a buy recommendation. After all, I've done this before, been fired before. Why not get fired again? So I said, no. Initially, I was going to put out KLLM transportation services, but I have no idea who they are or where they are. I've never heard about them. And I'm too lazy to look it up. So I pick rider systems. You know why? Because I once saw a truck go by and a rider on the side. And I know what they do. They rent out trucks. They look cheap. 2.8 times EBITDA. You remember the rule of thumb, six times EBITDA? This should make a private equity investor drool with joy, right? This is about as cheap as it gets. So I put out a buy recommendation, buy rider system, it trades at 2.8 times of a time. You're going to play devil's advocate. Ask me the questions. 
I, we should we saw what drove EV to EBITDA, right? You remember the variables? So what Yuki? Tax rate. So so the question is, what's the tax rate? If I told you to write a system with an eighty percent tax rate and everybody else has twenty, that would explain it away. In this case, it turns out they're all U.S. companies, roughly. So let's take that off. What's the next? You want go ahead, Sophie. We'll come to reinvestment rate first because as a percent wet fuel, we know we can go cost to capital, all you if there were if rider systems were a Venezuelan trucking company, that might explain it wasn't that the growth and then all mature companies, then we get to the reinvestment. And I have to fill in some, I have to give you some backstory on how trucking companies reinvest. Trucking companies replace their entire fleets every five, six, or seven years. Why do they do that? Because they get much better discounts when they replace the entire fleet rather than increases. So rather than ask me what the reinvestment rate is, Sophia, what's the question you're going to ask me about right assist given this, this way of reinvestment? Or how old is my fleet, right? And that would have settled the problem because it turned out that rider systems are the oldest fleet in the center. You're saying, so what? It looks cheap. You go buy the stock. Four weeks later, I'll predict what's going to happen. You're going to wake up to a Wall Street Journal story that Rider Systems has just borrowed five billion dollars to buy new trucks, and your EV to EBITDA that was two point eight two. The minute they do that, it will become six times that because remember the debt will now become part of your invested capital. This actually, I pulled off an, an actual sell side equity research report. We put a buy recommendation right of systems. And they've done it entirely in the EV to EBITDA. I went and collected the age of every trucking company's fleet and added to the Excel spreadsheet. That's all I did. And the minute you did that, it jumped out at you. That's what I mean about sloppy pricing. I have no problem with using EV to EBITDA, but at least have the good sense to control for the differences and ask the right questions. Because then I can buy into your pressure. So after my ill-fated rider systems recommendation, I get fired again. What's even more boring than trucking companies? Grocery stores. Anybody value a grocery store? What's a growth rate look like for a U.S. grocery store? 3%, 4%. Even fat people have leveled off, right? They're not eating more. You need change in food. And if people are dieting, it's bad news for you. What kind of margins do grocery stores have? Two, three percent. What kind of story are you going to tell for a grocery is the kind of story that puts people to sleep. It's a low growth, low margin business where people buy things they need every day. Boring. But it fits, right? So I took the grocery store business, I took all the grocery stores, put up a scatter plot, and guess what? Most of them behave very well. They fit in between the two lines, and there is this outlier. You know what that is? That's a first coming of Whole Foods. Kind of blue grocery store analyst minds, right? Because here was a grocery store where they charged four times as much for eggplant, and then offered you food that you know you felt rich, you bought, and if you didn't feel rich, you basically looked and said, Oh my god, I can't buy that. Now yeah. it's a high margin grocery store, never, never been seen in the US before. And it threw analysts off. So I remember looking at Whole Foods then, and equity research analysts you know, saw that it traded a much higher multiple of revenues. And I used price to sales. I should have used EV to sales, to be quite honest, but I stayed with price because that's what they were using. And they gave a story. They said, it's okay. It's okay. You know, it's okay because the price had gone up, but it's trading at a high multiple because it is a higher margin, which is true. It has a higher margin, but does that justify trading at 1.5 times revenue? So here's what I did. I ran a regression of price to sales against net margins for just grocery stores, plugged in Whole Foods margin, 3.4%, which is higher than the industry average. And I got a predicted price to sales of 0.43. What does that mean? Even after I control for its higher margin, it should be trading at 0.43 times revenues. It's trading at 1.9 times revenues. <coughs> the price, even with the margins. Then I lost interest in Whole Foods. I tend to lose interest quickly in these things. A year later, I revisited the sector and I did a scatter plot. I looked above the line expecting to see Whole Foods up at the top. And guess where it is? 
it was the most underpriced stock in the sector. It gone from what had happened in the intervening year is they'd had a bad earnings report. People had kind of sold everything because they basically didn't understand the company. They pushed the price down, went from being the most overpriced grocery store to the most underpriced grocery store. I said, that's interesting. And I came back in 2010 and Garrett is back again above the line. It's like watching a manic depressive in action, right? You need some mood swings kind of adjuster somewhere in there. But that's what happens when you get a new player in a business and people don't understand it. They don't get it right. They overshoot, they undershoot, they overshoot, they undershoot. I actually tracked Whole Foods through 2013 and 2013 it fell right on the line. And I said, okay, finally they get it. They know what to do with the company. It takes a while though. Think of Tesla, right? What auto analyst had ever seen a company like Tesla? They still can't figure it out. It takes a long time to adjust because you think in metrics you were used to given what the sector looked like. And now you have a player who's playing a very different game. So 2013, finally, people had figured whole food. They think back to boring grocery business. 2015, I took a brief glimpse again at the grocery business. And the new, there's a new kid in town. You know what that, what, what uh, you ever, ever heard of Sprouts? Sprouts is a West Coast base. It's like a, it, it, it's like a hippie version of Whole Foods. You know, that's, I mean, it used to be a store called Henry's where you had big bins you could get food out of. So they're like, you know, you don't like Whole Foods because you feel it's full of yuppies. You can come to Sprouts and you can spend a lot of money and still feel like you're one of the common people. It's, it's a store designed for Berkeley people. You can say that's, you know, that's basically what it is. I, I taught at Berkeley for two years. I love the place, but it's full of people that you don't want to hang out too long with because you might get contaminated along the way. Yeah. But again, it's a store that people didn't understand. And you can see it starting at the top. I, I should track Sprouts to see what's happened over time. But maybe eight years later, it's now right down towards the line. So take sectors where there's a new player entering who's different from everybody else, and you're going to see this pricing, mispricing kind of there. How many of you are valuing young money losing companies? Kind of, right? I think of Uber, it's still young, it's money losing. So quite a few of you are. So up till now, I've given you all these nice pictures where things fit and you put in the right variables, you get an R squared, that's reasonable, you can make predictions. I'm going to get you ready for a scenario which is going to make you very unhappy. Remember when I valued Amazon in 2000, I found it overvalued dot-com stock. I decided to do a pricing of Amazon at the same time. So I said, I'm going to do a pricing. How different, different. And I knew the only multiple I could use was revenue multiples, right? So I used a price to sales. Again, in hindsight, I should have used EV to sales. And I said, I know price to sales is explained by net margin. So I'm going to throw in price to sales versus net margin to a scatter plot. And this is what I saw in my stomach dropped. What does that look like? A shotgun blast, right? I mean, if I ask you, can you fit a line in? You're saying, I have no idea what the line is like. And if I ran a regression of price to sales against net margin, you know what kind of R squared I'm going to get, right? Undaunted, I ran the regression anyway. And I wasn't surprised. The R squared I got was 4%. But here's an even scarier number. See that coefficient on net margin? Minus 7.54. How would I read that? The more negative your net margin, the higher your price to sales ratio. Now, some dot com companies took that to heart, right? You lost a billion. We can lose two. You lose one. We can lose four because it looked like the market. But even bubble markets are not crazy. And here's the reason this regression is not working. No person in their right mind was pricing a dot-com company based on how much money it made last year, right? So when you invest in these companies, what are you basing the pricing on? What do you expect them to do in the future? How much are they going to grow? What margins are they going to make? And I'm actually running a regression against last year. Of course, I'm going to get low R squared. So for some of you, this is going to happen. If you're running an AI company, a cloud company, you run this, you know, you run this catapult, it's not going to work. 
So there are two tricks I'm going to pull out of my back pocket, or my front pocket, or where, whichever pocket. And you can use either one and see if it works for you. The first is to think about what investors in this sector think about when they price companies. And I'll give you what my, my, my thought process with dot-com companies. People were buying dot-com companies because they wanted growth. So I said, I want to focus on revenue growth. High revenue growth companies should be priced at, should have higher price, price to sales ratios than low revenue growth companies. You agree? Second, I hypothesize that as companies got bigger, the price to sales ratio will have to come down. Why? Because if you're a million dollar company trading at a hundred times revenues, it's not a big deal. But if you're a billion dollar company, that becomes much more difficult. So that's my the third is when you're investing in these young startups, you know many of them will not make it. So the higher the chance a company will not make it, the lower the price to sales ratio should be with that company. And that's the regression I ran. I took log of revenues to capture how big the revenues were, saying bigger companies should trade at lower multiples of revenues. I took revenue growth, saying higher revenue growth companies should have higher multiples. And finally, I looked at cash as a percent of revenues. And what's that capture? You think of how young companies fare. It's not because they can't make a debt payment. It's because they run out of cash. So my argument was the more cash a company has on, on hand, the less likely it is to fail. In fact, equity research analysts in the dot-com era used to measure what's called a cash burn time period. How many months of cash do you have? Arguing that the more months of cash you have, the greater the chance of survival. They ran the regression. Good news is the signs are all consistent. As revenues go up, price to sales ratios come down. As revenue growth goes up, price to sales goes up. And the more cash companies have, the higher the price to sales ratios. Take a look at the T-statistics though. If I were doing this right, which, which of the variables should I take out of this regression? Log of revenues, now, much as I'd like to hypothesize, market didn't seem to count. I, now, I, I'm gonna leave it in there, but if I rerun it, I'd take it out. I took Amazon's numbers and plugged them into this regression. Predicted, so I plugged in Amazon's revenues, Amazon's growth rate, Amazon's cash as a percentage. And I got a predicted price to sales ratio for Amazon of 30.42. It was actually trading at 25.6 times revenues. Based on my pricing, what am I finding for Amazon? That it is underpriced. And this was on exactly the same day. I ran this on the same day. I did my, remember the DCF valuation I did of Amazon where I found it to be valued at 35, stock was trading at 84. I'm going to make what sounds like an incredibly contradictory statement, but I think both parts of this statement are true. In January 2000, we asked me about Amazon. I'd have said it's overvalued and underpriced. I'm not looking for vindication, but a year later, I'd have been right on both counts, right? What happened to the stock price? It went from 84 to 11. That's about an 80% drop in the stock price, but it dropped only 80%. You say, what do you mean only 80%? You know what happened to the rest of the dot-com sector? It dropped 95%. So the pricing was right. It was telling you you found the cheapest of these stocks. And so was the valuation. But that's something you need to remember when you do pricing. When you find something to be underpriced, you're just finding an underpriced relative to the other companies you're comparing it to. And vindication for you might be that you lost only 50% and everybody else lost 75%. So that's the pricing value disconnect. So that's the first way to deal with young companies is to bring in variables that you think reflect the pricing. Here's a second. You know what the biggest problem with pricing small, undeveloped companies is? I mean, let's take Isha. How much revenues do your co does your company have, Isha? Zero. No multiple is going to work for it, right? Anything divided by zero is going to blow up. You have no earnings, no cash flows. So when you have nothing of substance right now, you need to find something of substance. So what can you do? Go into a future year. You remember you project out revenues and earnings and all that neat stuff in your DCF? You're not doing a DCF, but you say, I'll take my revenues in year 10 or year five when I have a bigger revenue. And rather than applying a multiple to today's revenues, I'm gonna apply a multiple to year five or year 10 revenues. It's a neat trick, right? You take the... 10 billion in revenues you have in your, your 10, you apply it eight times revenue or five times revenue, you get 50 billion as your 
It's called a forward pricing. I'm going to add a note of caution. What you see in that forward pricing, you've got to convert into a pricing today, right? Because you're paying for the stock today. And there's going to be many a slip between the cup and the lip. What looks like a big number in a forward pricing can start to slip away when you bring it today. Why? Let's start with the obvious reason. If I get an $80 billion pricing in your debt, what's the first adjustment I need to make to bring it to pricing today? The time value of money, right? So I can do take a risk-free rate and discount, but there's also risk. So when I discount back at the cost of capital, I've adjusted for both inflation and risk. The 80 billion is going to become 25 billion. It's a risky company. I mean, that effect is going to be large. What else could could affect my value today? To get to get that 80 billion dollar pricing, what has to happen? The company has to live to your 10, right? If there's a 30% chance of failure, that's got to be factored and that's going to lower the value as well. So I've got to adjust for time value of money. I've got to adjust for risk. I've got to adjust for failure risk. And finally, if I have lots of negative cash flows in years one, two, three, four, and five, which is almost a given, what do I need to do? I need to issue fresh equity, which is going to dilute my holding, which also will lower my value today. I remember when I first valued uh, Tesla, I got a lot of pushback not about the valuation itself, but about the fact that there was a terminal value of 69 billion and the value that I was giving the company was 8 billion today. They said, what happened? How did the 69 billion become 8 billion? So I actually took my 69 billion and broke it down into how it became 8 billion. So the first thing I did was I took the cash flows, discounted the back of the risk-free rate and that takes out the time value effect. And I discounted with the risk premium built in the cost of capital, brought it down even more. Then I brought it down for the dilution. And by the time this was all said and done, I said, look, 69 billion in your 10, even if you believe that will be worth only 8 billion today, because you got to adjust for all these factors. A lot of analysts I see, especially in young sectors, use forward pricing. They use it without almost thinking through the consequences of what do I need to control for to get there? Because lots of things that can drain value as you go along. Any questions on forward pricing? So I have no problem with you using forward pricing to price your company because there's nothing of substance today. But once you get the forward pricing, think about the adjustments you will need to make. And many of those adjustments are adjustments we had to make when we did discounted cash flow valuation. Ultimately, in pricing, you've got to be pragmatist, right? The question you're asking is not what should drive the pricing, but what is driving the pricing. I don't want to be mysterious, but we come in these preconceptions, especially from the intrinsic value world. Price earnings ratio should be higher for high growth companies. They should be lower for riskier companies. But ultimately, the market might care about none of that stuff and be pricing something else into the company. This is where things like market value per user, market value per subscriber, market value per dot com, you know, per you know, whatever it is come into play because often intrinsic value people dismiss it. They say, that makes no sense. Why would you price a company based on users? Why not? But that's what the market cares about. In 2013, Twitter went public and I valued at the time of its IPO. In fact, I, I reproduced that valuation last year when Elon took over Twitter so you can actually see my 2013 discounted cash flow valuations. It came up with $18 per share. At the same time, I wanted to price Twitter. So I went and looked up social media companies that made their money from online advertising. Those that I define as my comparable group. Those are the companies who were publicly traded. There are the market caps and enterprise values. And then I collected a bunch of accounting data about these companies. What are your revenues, your EBITDA, your EBIT, your net income? And I also collected the number of users each of these social media platforms have. You can actually find this online. There are sites that actually track the number of users. I was completely agnostic. I said, I want to figure out why the market is attaching high prices to some companies and low price. I want to see what drives market caps in these companies. So that's my end game of the market caps of companies of all these variables. What's my starting point? How would I figure out what the market is pricing in the most? What should I do?
I ran a correlation matrix. It's a kind of a very simple tool. Basically, I took all my variables and said, tell me what's correlated with what else. Hey, take a look at the first column. That's my the higher the correlation, the more the market is factoring that in. What's the biggest variable driving market cap? Oh, there you go, number of users. Same thing with enterprise value. Now you and I can say, look, that doesn't make sense. You'd be focusing on cash flows. It doesn't matter. That's what the market is pricing in. That's what you got to play. In 2013, social media companies were being priced based on the number of users. And you know how this played out, right? If you're a VC, you're building a social media company, what are you gonna encourage the entrepreneur to try to do? Get more users. I'm not gonna blame them for doing it because guess who's feeding this frenzy? Investors who price companies based on users will create VCs who encourage entrepreneurs to build up the user base. And 10 years later, you can pick up the debris of companies that are great user building machines, but terrible at monetizing those users. So here's how I priced Twitter. I went back to the previous page and I computed the app. So I computed the EV divided by user. So EV per use for each company. The median value was about $100 per user across these companies. Why is the, the number vary across companies? It's like a market estimate of lifetime value of a user. Maybe some companies get more value than others. Twitter had 240 million users on the day it went public. Let's do a pricing of Twitter. How much is the user worth to the market? $100, right? $240 times 100 is $24 billion. I'm done, that's my price. You see, that is so simplistic. Guilty as charged. But you know what, when it went public, that's exactly the pricing that Twitter went public at around 24 billion. Pricing is incredibly powerful at explaining what you get for something at a point in time. It might not be great to make, try to make money on it over time, but that's what your job is to price companies. You know, you look for what drives the price. So the last segment of what I want to do in this section is talk a little bit about hey, why do we stay sector focused? Because once you can do regressions, you can control for differences in growth and risk and payout. You know, why can't I compare a company to every company in the market? What do you gain by doing it? You get a much bigger sample. What do I lose by doing it? I have a lot more different companies in my sample. So about starting about 25 years ago, at the start of every year when I collected my data, I ran a regression of price earnings ratios against growth payout and made it, pretty much every multiple across the entire month. So I'm gonna start with the chart. I always do this. And I run this chart first because it brings my expectations down dramatically. When I look at price earnings ratios, I know the variable that should matter the most is growth, right? So I run a scatter plot of price earnings versus growth against the market. You see why it brings my expectations on? I don't even know what to describe that as. It's got a big lump in the middle. I have no idea. You know, maybe if I took the outliers out, I could put some. You know, when I look at this, this graph, and this is the most powerful variable explaining PE ratios. I know when I run my regression, I'm not going to see 80% R squared or 70% R squared or even 50% R squared. I get a 25%. I was actually pleasantly surprised by this 25% R squared because after that plot, I said maybe 12%, maybe 15%. 25% is pretty good. Am I disappointed? It's not my weapon of choice in the first place. What did I want to do? I want to do a discounted cash flow evaluation. You kept talking about PE ratios. I said, okay, you want to use PE ratios. Here's a mirror that I want to hold up in front of you so you can see how badly it works. Let's take the regression apart though. The constant is 8.63. What does that tell me? That's a base from which I'm going to build off. If the PE for the market rises, that base is going to get higher. That's the starting. Second. Every 1% increase in growth increases my PE by point. Does that make sense? Higher growth companies have higher PE. No. In a rough measure, that's a price of growth in the market. That's how much the market is willing to pay for higher growth companies. Then I looked at beta. Every increase in beta 1 increases my PE by 2.23. That makes sense? High beta companies have... High risk companies should have lower PE ratios, right? Don't do anything silly like what? 
I don't like the sign, I'll make that a minus. It doesn't work that way, okay? We'll talk about why you're getting the wrong sign. It is what it is, right? Higher beta companies have higher P ratios. And finally, on payout, every 1% increase in the payout ratio increases my P. That makes sense. It's more efficient growth. R squared is 25%. As I said, I'm not disappointed. I'm not pleased. What does it mean? My predicted PE that comes out of this regression is going to have a much wider range. But I want to spend a few minutes on basic statistics. So if your statistics is really strong and you find this insulting, you're welcome to leave the room. When I run a regression, this is a regression. It's a linear regression, right? You know what I mean by linear regression? You run any regression. If you don't do anything, it will be a linear regression. So every 1% increase in growth has the same effect as you go one to two, two to three. So the first thing you worry about are non-linear relationships. Now, at the moment, it's an abstraction, but with each multiple, I'm going to talk about when you should worry with P and growth, it's not a big deal, but with peg ratios, it's something I'm going to have to deal with. What do you do with nonlinear relationships? There are nonlinear regressions you can run, where instead of fitting a straight line, the line kind of bends, it's kind of neat to look at it, much more difficult to use. You do not. So that's the first thing. The second is non-stationarity. What does that mean? I ran this regression on January 5th of 2023. Can I still use it today to price companies? I'm going to let you do it. But you know what? Things change in this regression. The coefficients, I've run this regression every year for 25 years. I can show you the coefficients over time. The variables stay the same, but the coefficient shift, that's non-stationarity. The relationship between Pricing and growth and pricing and risk and pricing and payout change over time, which makes it difficult to keep using regressions without rerunning. <laughs> and there's a third issue, and this might be something you remember or don't remember from your statistics class, depending on how much you enjoyed it or did not enjoy it. What called multicollinearity. I remember listening to that in my class. What the heck is that? Why should I care? I should have cared more. Multicollinearity talks about the fact that when you run a multiple regression, the independent variables are supposed to be independent of each other. They're supposed to be uncorrelated with each other. What are my three independent variables? Growth, beta, and payout. There isn't a snowball's chance in hell that they can't be correlated with each other, right? Because if you take high growth companies, they tend to have low payout ratios and higher betas. The thing I can do. In fact, I can't find any three variables in finance that are uncorrelated with it because they're all driven by the same companies. We'll come back and talk about what to do with multicollinearity, but something that might explain some of the strange output we get from this regression. In fact, what did I find for beta that it had a positive coefficient, right? What if high beta, high growth companies have high betas? And that they that tends to be true. What does a computer see when you give it data? You might label the data, whatever, but it sees four columns of numbers, right? So if all your high growth companies have high betas, are you, can you blame the computer for getting confused about what beta is measuring? In that regression, the way to explain the, the positive coefficient on beta is beta is starting to act as a proxy for growth instead of a proxy for risk, which is one reason you're seeing that. We'll talk about what to do, as I said in a minute, but that's the rationale. Now, and just uh, I've been talking about t statistics with these regressions. Of course, you need to check the t statistics to make sure they're significant. So, you know, you know the rules. It's nice to have a t statistic higher than two, but between one and two, you might. But if you have t statistics 0 0.6, 0 0.5, 0 0.3, just get rid of it. It's creating noise in your prediction. It's not worth leaving it. One final point if you run a traditional regression, whether it's in, in Excel or whether it's a mini tab, you're in the statistics package that they have. I don't know which package that is that. You run a traditional regression, it runs it with a constant, an intercept. And if you get a negative intercept, which you can, it can become a problem if you're using it in pricing. Let's talk about what? Let's say your intercept is minus 10, which is completely plausible. In a regression, you get a What do you do? You take the minus 10 and then you add adjust for P, the growth and the risk. But what if after all the adjustments, you end up with a negative predicted value? P ratios can't be negative, right? So you're, you're ending up with numbers that can't be used. The thing is, there are fixed. 
you know, every statistics package I've ever seen, including Excel's own package, when you run a regression, it asks you a question. Do you want a constant in your regression? That's the default. It leaves a constant. But you can also pick a default where you take the constant out. What it does is it moves. Remember that best fit line? It moves it to go through the origin. In other words, through zero. It's not as good a fit anymore because you move the line, but you no longer have a negative intercept problem. Essentially, when you run that intercept less regression, the regression output will look like this. So this is my PE regression for 2023 without the intercept. And basically, it's still the same three variables. I can compute the least. You can use it just like a regular regression without this issue of having a negative intercept. I didn't have to do this in 2023 because the intercept was positive. But I think this was from 2019 when I had a negative intercept. I had to rerun the regression and remove it because I was getting too many predicted negative PE ratios, which I did not want. Question? It's it's the day basically. In, remember, the, it's the best fit line. So if you get the 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 scatter plot moved in a particular direction, remember the line just gets fit through it. So it's just a function of the data in that year and what caused. So there's no real fundamental reason. The data just has to get skewed and the intercept, intercept can get negative. This, this year, I think out of the six regions of the world that I ran the regression for, two had negative intercepts. There's nothing I could point to that said this is why it was. But for those reasons, I, regions, I re-ran the regression without the, the constant. And finally, there's the multicollinearity. This is actually what's called a correlation matrix. I took the independent variable and the dependent variables, put them on. See these beta growth and payout? If this were a perfect regression, beta payout and growth should have zero correlations with each other. That's what took them. You can see already that they're not zero correlations, right? Beta and growth are positively correlated. Growth and payout are negatively correlated. It's a, it's a fact of life. Are there statistical fixes? Yes. And if this were a statistics class, we could go to four sessions on how do you fit. I'm not interested. And here's why. When you get multicollinearity, it makes your coefficients behave in strange ways, like in the beta case, you know, positive instead of negative. But you can still use the regression to get predicted values. And that's all I care about. I want to use the regression to get predicted PE ratios. So I've never felt the urge to fix that. But if you're a statistics geek, and this is what makes you dick, there are ways you can get around that problem. So I'm going to close off by using this regression to make a prediction. I mean, the whole point of running this market regression was I wanted to use it to make predictions. So I have the market regression I ran for the US. I plug in the numbers for Disney at the start of 2023, their beta, their growth rate. I get a predicted PE for Disney of 21.43 with a caveat. What's the caveat? The R squared is only 25%. So there's probably a range of like 614 to 27, big range because the R squared is low. Disney's actual PE was 31.38. I think it was 31.36. So what does it make Disney to me? Relative to the market, how would I, how would I describe the, the output, or the conclusions I would get from this regression? Disney is overpriced. Complete the sentence. So overpriced, you always said relative to the market after adjusting for growth, risk, and payout. What am I going to do about it? I don't plan to do anything, but if I ran a hedge fund and I built it around this regression, you know what I would do? I would sell short the overpriced stocks and buy the underpriced stocks and get down on my knees and hope and pray that they all move towards the regression line. Because then I'm going to make money. So if you want to start a hedge fund over this weekend, be my guest. But you have the tools to do it if you want. I'll see you on Monday. <laughs>